President Teddy Roosevelt, he adopted this pet proverb, you've heard it before, speak softly and carry a big stick. By that he meant that if the U.S. had a strong military, it could work its will amongst the nations of the world. Uh, In 1901, Roosevelt elaborated on this phrase and this philosophy, and he said this, if a man continually blusters a big stick, will not save him from trouble, and neither will speaking softly avail if back of the softness there does not lie strength and power. When Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, he, he was not speaking of armies and foreign policies, but, but similar principles apply here. Uh, the meek Christian uh, does not need to bluster as if his or her own self-confidence could win the day. Uh, whether we are contesting a point, responding to criticism, or speaking of the hope within, we could do so with meekness today, with quiet confidence, for in back of the softness, if you will, lies the strength of the power of God. But is that relationship between strength and gentleness, between power and softness that we need to explore, especially when we don't get what we think is ours. Have you ever been disappointed like this? Something you think you definitely deserved to be either recognized for or to be given from someone else, and it seems as if you have been forgotten and ignored. Some of us this morning are still dealing with years of questioning God on why we did not get the things that we think we deserve. And it's hard in those moments, isn't it? To speak softly, but carry that stick in confidence. It's hard to have that kind of gentle strength today. What what, what do you think is rightfully yours that's been taken? Perhaps a relationship, one that you committed to, made the covenant of marriage for, but yet it's fallen apart, and perhaps it's ended. And maybe there's still sadness and bitterness uh, perhaps maybe it's something else. Maybe, maybe you think you deserve that raise. In fact, you really deserve that raise. And yet, you still don't seem to be recognized for the faithfulness that you have been doing and giving. Or perhaps that difficult person in your life who God keeps bringing into your life. Does the name come to mind right away? Why are you all looking at me? You're all looking at me. That God may be calling you to lovingly, continually sacrifice for, and you think you deserve a thank you? Anybody? And yet, it's hard to make sense of why they still treat you the way that you do. You know, we're in our series here this summer called Happy. You remember the emoji, the smiley face? Happy. Uh, Eight uncommon characteristics of a happy life. That for the follower of Jesus, the Beatitudes lay out for us what it truly means to be happy and blessed and flourishing in this world, not based upon happiness like we often will characterize it. Not based upon happiness that is only there as we compare ourselves to others and think, at least I'm doing better than them. A happiness that is not based upon the amount of money in our bank account. A happiness that is not based upon the amount of friendships we think we have in our corner, but a happiness, a flourishing, a blessing that recognizes it is the grace of God in my life, especially in times when it is most difficult that I could experience the most genuine expression of joy and happiness. The Beatitudes, they are these wildly surprising, blatantly countercultural, strangely revolutionary description of the type of people that God blesses and shows his grace towards. A few weeks ago, we talked about those who are poor in spirit. Do you remember? It was only two weeks ago. Humor me. 
Those that implore in spirit, they, they recognize their own need before God, that it is good to recognize that we need help from the Lord. And when we cry out to him in a poverty of spirit, we are saying, Lord, I need you. I depend on you. Have you prayed that prayer this week? Lord, I need you. God says his grace is there. You can be happy. Uh, last week we talked about mourning. Oh, what a downer, Pastor Mike, you know. Talking about embracing sadness and mourning. But remember what we said, distinctively Christian mourning mourns over sin and its effects in our world. How many of us have not shed a tear recently because of the sadness and brokenness of sin you've seen in a close family member or friend? Or how many of you, I hope, have even in a sadness mourned over sinful choices and attitudes and ways that you have acted in the recent past? That God tells us, blessed are us when we recognize that we fall short of God's glory, but yet we could come to him. We could cling to him. Blessed are those who mourn. And today in our scripture, we're going to be talking about the meek, those with gentle strength. Jesus says, blessed are those who are humble and meek, for they will inherit the land. Our, our choice this morning, we're going to see this in the text. We could either choose the way of the zealot in our life. The way of reaching for and grabbing after things that we think we deserve. Or we could choose the way of meekness. The way of the humble. Which do you think Jesus falls in? That's not a hard question, right? Do we grasp or do we trust God for how he's going to work in our life? So turn with me in God's word to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. I want to read these first 12 verses together. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. This morning, blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. This is a, a, a hard for us often to, to grasp as 21st century Americans. This idea of inheriting the earth or inheriting the land. Uh, a New York City, we are, we are a mobile city. We are often a very transient location for people who come and live here and make their time for a certain season. I, I worked in Manhattan at a church for many years and, and we turned over the, the people that were a part of that church every three to five years basically of, of people that would come and move and, and, and move on. And, and even in Staten Island that's true. In fact, I'm going to do a survey real quick. How many of you are born and raised on Staten Island? The few natives amongst us. You know one day when we die in the Staten Island Advance, the obituary will say native. Staten Islander. Mine will say native. I take really pride in that for some reason. I don't know. How many of you are from one of those other boroughs here originally born and raised? Jersey, we love you too. You know, as you look around in the crowd, you, you see that we come from all different areas here on our blessed isle and our beautiful city and our great region and world. And oftentimes it's, it's hard for us to, to, to identify a, a strong connection with our religious identity and a, and a piece of land or, or, or property. In fact, we recognize as followers of Jesus, where, wherever we go, we are the temple of the Lord. Amen. And we get to reside with him wherever we are, and we bring his presence wherever we go. Uh, but this is not true in, in all other religions. 
Uh, You think of Islam and you think of Mecca, the birthplace of Muhammad, a very sacred place in that religion. You think of Varanasia and the temple of Shiva there along the river Ganges in India, a, a central location for those in the Hindu faith. But for the Christian and for the 21st century American, tra- American transient New Yorker, our, our religious identity, is, is, our, our personal identity, our political identity is, is, is not always so identified with the land, with the location. But this was not always historically true for the people of God. We know that the Jewish faith, it was tied in very directly from its very beginning with the promise in Genesis chapter 12 that God would, through Abraham, make him a great name, that he would give him a lineage of many people, and that he would promise him a land In fact, in Deuteronomy 28, there's this amazing scene where where Moses is sharing the word of God with the nation of Israel one more time, and he's given this law. That's what Deuteronomy means, the second law, the second giving of the law. And and on Mount Ebal, he's going back and forth, and he talks about the blessings of following God, and he talks about the cursings if they don't. And, And one of the repercussions is seeing yourself taken out of the land, of the land. And while it's been customary for Christians and for translators to to see the word earth here in this verse and and think of the world as we know it, uh, there is little likelihood that Jesus uh, would have had that world in mind in that sense. Uh, we got to wrap our minds around the Bible's story for the first century Jew. And those to whom Jesus spoke didn't really care two figs about Italy and Gaul in their day. But what they did is simply wanted shalom in the land of Israel. Peace in the earth, the land as they knew it. In fact, you could read in Luke chapter 1, verses 67 to 79, Zechariah's idea of salvation there. It's this elimination of all enemies so that Israel could dwell in the land and worship in the temple in peace and in holiness. But when Jesus is sharing this message, it's in the midst of what's called a Second Temple Judaism. It's a time of great unrest. And there are different groups of people within Judaism of this day trying to fit Jesus into their box. We're never guilty of that in the 21st century, thank God, right? Uh, Josephus famously says that there were at least uh, four different sects within Judaism, according to his understanding of that day. There was the Pharisees, those spiritual elite, those Sadducees who stouted some of the supernatural like the resurrection. There were the Essenes, those who thought this monastic, ascetic life was the way forward. And then there was the Zealots. And this is where I want us to understand this morning. The Zealots. They had a passion for the land. They looked at the promises that God had made to Abraham. They looked at what God had said through Moses. And they looked at the trajectory of the history of the nation of Israel and what disobedience to God meant for them. And they they wanted to see leadership in the land again. And remember Jesus' followers? One of the disciples was Simon the, the who? The zealot. Think of this. Jesus brought around him these diverse group of individuals with varying different backgrounds of understanding of what it meant to be a Jew in that time and day. Various different political persuasions. Can you imagine what Matthew, the tax collector for the Roman Empire, the conversations that he had with Simon the Zealot? It's amazing to me that Jesus had such an eclectic sense of loving people and wanting people from different backgrounds, different experiences, different perspectives, but what does it mean to hold these things before Jesus and say, Jesus, how do we follow you in the midst of these, these differences and these brokenness and these, and, these, and, these, and these things that often divide us? I, do you think that's a good model for the church in the 21st century? Do you think it's a good model for us to welcome all people 
to Jesus, but to hold up Jesus and ask, how do we follow him? Well, Jesus did it. He practiced it. And this group of zealots that Simon was a part of, they were upset now for decades. In fact, the zealots in the first century, really, they believe it started historically right after that tax uh, under Quirinius. Do you remember that from the Christmas story? This is why Jesus had to go back, uh, uh, why Mary and Joseph had to go back to Bethlehem because of the taxation. Remember this? And there were revolts later on in, 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 in the mid-60s as well. They opposed Roman rule. And for a time later on, they occupied the land. And here's the kicker, the zealots. They wanted something that was rightfully theirs. But the problem was they wanted it at the cost of others around them. And if it took violence to grab the land, they were willing to do it. It's a sad indication in our own heart as well when we are willing to choose violence, not just physical, but verbal, emotional, and yes, you even see spiritual violence people could perpetrate, perpetrate against each other in order to get what you want. See, Jesus is saying, it doesn't make sense that we don't have the land, yes, but the way in which you want it is wrong. You can't grasp after it like this. The ones that inherit the land are the meek and the humble. Uh, what in your life have you wanted that's rightfully yours that you didn't get? Uh, as a pastor now, uh, for many years, I, I could tell you story upon story of counseling sessions. And, and, I, and I, have, I have counseling sessions where people come and it, it's, I want to learn about growing closer to Jesus. I want to learn about studying the Bible. I want to work through these things. I love those. But you know what's one of the more common times people have come to me for counseling? This is the truth. Asking for wisdom in how to deal with family members who have done them wrong when it comes to an inheritance. Can you believe that? Has that ever happened to you? Somebody you know? Uh, I, I read this story. This is not one of the examples that I've experienced, although I just heard one two weeks ago. But, 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 but I read this story. It's a true story. It, it was a man who, 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 had, who raised these four daughters, and they lived all around the country. This is a true story. And, and he died of cancer, a long battle with cancer. And his widow was left home in the home house in which they had been uh, raised. Uh, and, and all these daughters came back uh, with their husbands and their kids uh, to be a part of the funeral service. And they were all there beforehand at the house in the living room of this woman. And when the last couple came in, the last daughter and son came in, they noticed something strange as they walked into the living room. Everything in the house had a yellow sticky note on it with one of the three other sisters' names. I guess when you're late to the party, you don't get to get the family dishes. I don't know. Have you ever experienced something like that? I can't tell you how many people after the first service came up and said that same thing happened. We want what we think is rightfully ours, don't we? We're willing to break relationships in families if it means that to get it. Uh, what's a beautiful part of that story is the husband of this, one of these daughters, when he saw the foolishness of this scene as they're sitting around the dinner table and there's yellow sticky notes everywhere, you know, even on the curtains, right? Uh, he takes out a sticky note and he puts it on his mother-in-law, the widow, and he says, I'll t we'll take her. We'll take her. That's a true story. That's a true story. Uh, you know, we were willing to fight for what we think is ours. And whether that is recognition that we do not get, that we want, whether that is material in nature, for the first century Jew that Jesus is speaking to in this text, the, the land and the desire to see it set up, this is what they wanted more than anything else. And when we want something that's rightfully ours and we do not have it, it can destroy us in our pursuit of it. I know somebody who has been in years of legal fights with their siblings over a mere pittance of an inheritance. It'll destroy you. 
And so Jesus here in this text, in this amazing beatitude, is saying, you want to be happy? It is not found in grasping after the things you think you deserve, no matter how you could get it. You want to be truly happy? Choose meekness. Gentle strength. Uh, I want to define meekness for you here in a few ways. The first, it, it is being not overly impressed with a sense of your own importance. It's being gentle and humble and considerate. Here, here's things it is not. It is, it is not being aggressive, aggressive and, and full of anger. A good, a good uh, insight into our hearts is to see uh, what are the things that get us angry really quickly when, they, when we don't get them. And then ask ourselves, is this what we're truly, really wa- worshiping in our life? If you don't get recognition or that pat on the back, if you, if you don't have that other thing that you think this, this family member should be giving to you, whatever it is, we realize these idols we carry in our heart, these other individuals and things that we look to for our worship, meekness is the opposite of that. It's not aggression, it's anger. It is conquering through love and a patience. And here we go, you ready? I'm going from preaching to meddling real quick. Here it comes. And a willingness to be wronged for the benefit of others. That's meekness. That's meekness. To absorb anger and unjust treatment if it means the benefit of others around us. Jesus says, those that are meek like this that not uh, attempted to, to violently demand their way, you will be happy even if you don't have those things you think you need. Psalm uh, 37 is a popular psalm in the first century for Jews of that day, and, and one of the verses here is, is so key in understanding in Psalm 37, 11, The meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Notice peace and blessing associated with the land. We're going to see later on that when the zealots overtook the land, there was not peace. There was not prosperity. You could grasp after things in this way, but it will never satisfy. A a quote, uh, framed over against wrath, anger, and violence, rapaciousness, theft, and violent takeovers, the meek are unlike the zealots who used violence to seize. The meek Absorb unjust conditions in the form of nonviolent, non retaliatory resistance that creates a calm, countercultural community of love, justice, and peace. Have you ever been around somebody like this? Somebody that from the outside, when you notice the things that have happened in your, their life, you think, how can they not be filled with anger? Somebody who perhaps has come through a a bad marriage relationship that just got torn apart. And perhaps they they were the recipient of of, of just vitriol for, for years and years. And yet, there's a calm commitment to love in their speech. I spoke to one individual who really got wronged in this inheritance story of his in his own life. And in fact, as he was sharing it, I was getting angry for him. I'm like, oh, no. They did what? You know, I usually don't do that. That's like against counseling 101, but I I couldn't help myself. Such a juicy tale, you know. I said, no way. No. What did you do? I said, oh, I released it. There's a calm, countercultural commitment to love and peace. Have you been wronged? Is there something you think you deserve? Is there a relationship that you are on the end that has received most of the hate? God says the meek, those who are humble, wait and trust in God and have gentle strength in the midst of it. You know what I love about the God of the scriptures is that he does not call us to anything of which he himself has not went through on our behalf. Are you with me? Think 
of Jesus himself. Jesus, this great example of strength, soft, quiet strength in the midst of the accusations and unjust words that are hurled against him. Jesus, the cup, the bread, the communion table that we're about to take of together, it's a reminder that through gentle strength, Jesus conquered. Jesus conquered. Listen to Jesus in the scene in Matthew 27 before Pilate. It says, at the festival of the Gustav, it was the governor's custom to release to the crowd a prisoner that they wanted. And at their time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, who is it that you want me to release to you? Barabbas, a notorious prisoner, the Bible says. Or Jesus, who's called the Christ, the Messiah. For he knew it was because of the envy that he had handed them over. And while he was sitting in the judge's bench, his wife said to him, Have nothing to do. He is a righteous man. Today I've suffered terribly because of him in a dream. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to execute Jesus. And which of the two would you like for me to release, Pilate says. And they say who? Barabbas, give us the, let me quote it again, notorious prisoner and crucify Jesus. Crucify him. Crucify him, they cry out. Jesus, at the cross, demonstrates for us meekness, gentleness, humility, willing to be wrong so that we might be blessed. Are you with me this morning? Willing to face pain so that we might be made whole. Who was a more innocent sufferer ever than Jesus, the Son of Man himself, God in the flesh, the innocent sacrifice, the perfect lamb of God who did no wrong to deserve what he was experiencing. And yet, in gentle strength, Jesus absorbs the sin of the world so that we might be forgiven. Amen? This is what he calls of us, to be people of meekness, like this, of gentle strength. Uh, Meekness means not being overly impressed with one's self-importance. Meekness means it's coming. Not being retaliatory in our actions. Meekness means not throwing our weight around. Meekness means for the cause of Jesus, for the name of God, for the hope of the gospel in the life of others, I will take a loss in that others might be forgiven, that others might be made whole. For some of us that are experiencing these unjust actions of those around us, you may be the only follower of Jesus in that sphere of influence, the only one who knows Jesus in that family situation. How you act, how I act and respond matters eternally so because it's not about us getting what we want even if it's rightfully ours. See further the land, remember? But it's about us meekly submitting and trusting in the Lord. Uh, you know, as, as a kid, I, I used to get a, a monthly uh, Missionary of the Month book club my parents signed me up for uh, from, I think it was Bethany House Publishers. And every month we would get a different uh, missionary book sent to our house and I would read them through as I would learn about the story of how the gospel had spread and throughout the world uh, in the centuries prior. And one of my favorite, one that you all know no doubt very well, is, is, is that story of Hudson Taylor. Uh, he, who adopted Chinese culture and ways, learning its language and wearing its clothing, uh, and, and started China Inland Mission. 
It sent out hundreds of missionaries and workstations and schools and, and was involved in hospitals and other things, helping share the love and hope of Jesus in China. In fact, it's believed that upwards of 18,000 people came to Christ during the work of the China Inland Mission during the time of Hudson Taylor. He has this amazing quote about what it's like in our life when we experience difficulty and trials, especially unjust ones. He says this, not infrequently our God brings his people into difficulties on purpose that they might come to know him as they could not otherwise do. Some of us gotta write that down in our Bibles. God may be bringing us into a difficulty on purpose that we might know him as we might not otherwise do. And then he reveals himself as a very present help in time of trouble. He makes the heart glad at each fresh revelation of the Father's faithfulness. He who only will see a small part of the sweet issues of a trial often feel that we would not for anything have missed them. How much more shall we bless and magnify his name in the hidden things when they are brought to light? Hudson Taylor lived this out. Hudson Taylor ministered right then after the time that led out to the great Boxer Rebellion. You remember it from your history classes. The, a violent anti-foreign and anti-Christian movement which took place in China between 1899 and 1901. For those that opposed to foreign imperialism and to Christianity and to, had pro-nationalistic sentiments. Uh, there was much violence done during this time historically in China. And the China Inland Mission, of which Hudson Taylor was a part, took a huge loss. Millions of dollars, if not more, worth of their property was destroyed. Debates, and, and the, the stats are different, but anywhere up to 58 of their missionaries were killed. Upwards of 23 missionary children were killed. After the great powers intervened and defeated these, these forces, uh, there was then the beginning of reparations. $61 billion over 39 years to be doled out to those who were affected greatly. Think in your mind what the number total would have been for you. And those responsible for giving it out came to Hudson Taylor and the China Inland Mission. And they said, quantify for us how much in reparations should go towards the China Inland Mission and the missionaries and the families, dozens of whom who had died or were killed during this time. And this was his response. We want nothing that we might instead Show the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Wait a second. <laughs> They've come to him with what it amounted to a blank check. I choose meekness because their mission was to see people transformed by the gospel. You can argue, and I believe the lines are not that far to make the argument, that the work of Hudson Taylor inspired much of what we saw in the late 20th, uh, 19th, early 20th century missionary movement. A missionary movement that saw men and women share the gospel across the world. Unknown thousands, if not more, of men and women who were inspired by Hudson Taylor and led other missions efforts throughout the world at that time and beyond. Inspired by his life story. Who knows how many souls were changed for eternity because of the example of meekness. Are you with me this morning? It's not the violent that get their way in the end. That's what Jesus is saying in this verse today. It's about those who in gentle strength trust in him. The meek trust in Jesus and submit to him even when they can't make sense of their circumstances. Two questions for you this week as you ponder applying this in your life. First, what circumstances, personal or public, confound you today? Anybody confused here today? 
Hopefully not because of the preacher, but that happens sometimes. Is there something going on in your life that's totally confounding to you? Like, why is this happening? Why is this relationship not healing? Why does this circumstance keep popping up? Why does this temptation keep coming up? I thought I had victory over all these things. Or as you look out public, as you look out in the world, are there situations that confound you today? It's a good practice this week. Write them out. Oh, Lord, this done does confuse me. <laughs> this and that, and this person, and this relate, just list them out. And then secondly, do this spiritual introspection. Ask yourself, do I trust in Jesus and submit to him to handle it in his time and in his way? Do you trust him like that this morning? Do I trust him like that this morning to know that God in his time and in his way will answer it? You can only see this if you've lived life long enough and have already experienced these moments Moments perhaps at the workplace where uh, uh, you had a, a supervisor who just treated you poorly and it took years and years and years for them to be exposed and now they're no longer there and you're still there. You realize, Lord, my patience with you. In, in marriages, some that have seen God do amazing works of restoration. I could give you story after story uh, for years and years where, where marriages were broken and falling apart and one side was not playing right and fair and yet through love and sacrifice, we see the other come to faith and to trust and follow God. It happens. I believe it does. It still does. Will you trust and submit that God in his time and in his way is working in your life, especially in those things that you think you rightfully deserve and that should be yours? What do you need to let go of today? What do you not to need to demand anymore, even if it's yours? What do you need to offer up to God today with open hands and say, Lord, you got to do the work here. Because if I start doing it the way I want to do it, oh, it's going to get ugly real quick. <laughs> Lord, I need you to do your will. I need you to work. I trust you. You know, I love to study history because the perspective of history enables us to see the wisdom of God in the long term. As I said earlier, the zealots got their way in that first century. In 66, they were able, 66 AD, they, they were able to take over control of Jerusalem. But they lost it in AD 70. And they had to run away and hide. Do you remember where they did so? Masada. You could go there today. I was there a year and a half ago. As they went to the top of this great mountain fortress, they were able to hide themselves away until over several years later, the Romans built basically what amounted to a dirt mound to make their way up. And when they went to the top, those that had survived had already taken their own lives. You see, the end of the zealot movement was one where anger and wrath, it burned out. You just can't flame the, the embers of anger and wrath forever. They're going to burn out in your life. You can't keep it going. Revenge, it's just, it's going to eat away and dissipate in the end in your life. We need to, I need to humbly say, God, I offer it to you. And whatever bitterness, whatever way I was treated poorly, whatever thing in my life that I have not received yet that I know I deserve, God, I, I choose meekness and humility because Jesus did. Think of it, the zealot movement died out. It would have looked powerful in its day for a couple year period. But the Jesus movement, uh, has that died out yet? Yeah, well, you're sitting here today, okay? The Jesus movement has not died out, has it? The movement of meekness and humility and love and sacrifice, what Jesus began and modeled what he talked about in this text, is one that is still there. And yes, the promise is still true. For those that are meek, we have this hope of inheriting the land, this new heaven, this new earth forever with Jesus. Amen? And this is our hope and our confidence. Will you trust him this morning? Will you choose the way of the zealot or the way of the meek? And will you find happiness, uncommon in this world, a happiness, that content in trusting God in his way and on his time?